Um, this is a native interpreter for Elm. My name is Philip. I work at Concordium. We all know this because we just said that. And I want to talk a bit about why we're using Elm uh, in another domain. So we are not using Elm to write only front-end applications, graphical user interfaces. Uh, we are also using Elm to write um, smart contracts on a blockchain-like system. So Elm, we all know why we like Elm. Um, it has a really great uh, abstraction model. There's a lot of things we don't have to worry about, like parallelism and exceptions and immutable state um, and so on. And it also has some powerful features like message passing and a strict and powerful type system and also referential transparency, which is the property where you can replace a function call with the return value of that function call. So you can freely memoize as much as you want. And in our domain, we basically have the same constraints. Uh, the only real difference is that we can send money in our messages. So I'm going to talk a bit about how the Elm compiler works. First off, how the Elm compiler finds files. So when you write, when you type Elm make on the command line, it will first off uh, find your Elm JSON file by looking at your root files, the, the command line arguments. And once it found that, it's going to uh, look at all the dependencies and make sure all the dependencies are downloaded and in your global cache. And then it's going to parse the headers of your root files. So that's your command line arguments. Just the header, so just the import statement, basically. And then it's going to find all of those files and recursively find just the import uh, statements until it has found all of the files that are included in the build. Then, for all of these different modules, in parallel, it's going to parse the entire file. It's going to canonicalize the file, which is uh, whenever you write import my module exposing blah and you use blah in your source code, it's going to convert the, the blah in your source code into my module dot blah, basically. And then it's going to run the type checker, make sure all, all of your types align, and then run the exhaustiveness checker to make sure it didn't miss anything in a case expression. And then it's going to convert um, the canonicalized AST into an optimized AST, which is like halfway to JavaScript. So that's, that does things like uh, tail recursion optimization and uh, compiling pattern matching down to data structures instead. And we had to make a few changes to the compiler to, in order to make it work in our domain. So the big thing is that Elm compiles to JavaScript and the only number type available in JavaScript are doubles. And <laughs> doubles are a mess. So uh, in order to make the, the runtime deterministic so that between different machines and different CPU architectures and so on, uh, we always need the same result. That means we cannot use floating points. We also um, run about 100,000 applications in parallel and send messages between them. So it's a bit unconventional as well. And we don't want to run 100,000 node instances in parallel. <laughs> so when we get a message to an app, we want to spin up that application, load the, st the state from disk, uh, execute the update function, and then store everything back on disk again. And this requires a bit, uh, like, a few changes, basically. Uh, despite all this, we're able to reuse almost all of uh, the compiler. So the basically, the, the only thing we have changed right now to build the interpreter is that the, the optimized AST has been replaced with uh, our own AST. And uh, instead of taking all of these optimized ASTs and combining them into a JavaScript blob, we are interpreting them and um, basically simplifying an expression in the context of all of your models. So I'm going to tell a bit, a bit about how the interpreter works. We'll start just with the simplest interpreter I can think of, which is evaluating mathematical expressions. So if we parse this expression, we know that uh, due to operator precedence, 
uh, we know that uh, this is the expression that we get. And then we can recursively just simplify this bottom up uh, until we have a single answer. I like to think of inter interpreters as uh, simplifiers. Just do what it says, like one plus two is three. So just return a three whenever you see that. And we're going to use a similar approach for, um, for the AST when we are interpreting. So interpreters are really fun to write. I, in the process of, of writing this talk, I accidentally wrote an interpreter. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to port some Haskell code over to Elm, and eight hours wait, went by, and basically I accidentally wrote an interpreter. So they're really fun to write because you already know how everything works. You all know Elm. And implementing each new language feature, like every small piece, is just a few lines of code, and you immediately get feedback that you now support more things. So it's really rewarding to, uh, to write. So I'm going to show you uh, an interpreter in Elm for Elm. So we'll start off with, a with a, just a, the pure skeleton, which is if Elm only had integers. So we need a data structure to uh, capture the expressions, so just any Elm expression. In this case, we only have integers. And then we need an interpret function that simplifies this exp expression. But that's not enough. We need uh, to do something, like something useful with this interpreter. So binary operators. If you think of binary operators, like infix operators, it's just an operand uh, operator and two arguments on either side. And here's how the, the AST corresponds to Elm source code. And since it's just values, just data structures, uh, you can ref refer to them as, like store them in variables like you're used to in Elm uh, when you're building this AST. The implementation of um, like evaluating a binary operator call is to simplify the two arguments and then look at the operand in the middle and just do what it says. So similarly, we can add support for multiplication and subtraction. One more thing that I think is really important in um, programming languages is variables. And we need a place to store the variables. Uh, in this case, we're using a dictionary from just variable name to the value of that uh, expression. And we're just threading it through everywhere in the recursive calls. Then we need a way to do a lookup from the environment, so dereferencing a variable. So we're adding the variable expression. And when we interpret the, var the variable expression, we just do a lookup, and that should always succeed. Otherwise, we have a bug somewhere, which is why I have these debug.todos. There's a lot of those. Uh, don't worry about that. <coughs> and we need a way to introduce variables. So we have simple let expressions here, where you can introduce a single variable. Um, and if you want to introduce more variables, you can nest these however deep you want. And the implementation is pretty straightforward. You just insert that new variable binding uh, and evaluate the body of the let expression. Next up, simple functions, basically lambdas. Um, right now, they take uh, a single variable uh, argument, so the pattern match on a name, and the way we we call this is that, well, in this example, we have uh, a function called f, which is the identity function. And we're calling it with an argument 3. And the way the interpreter is going to interpret this is that it's going to look at the right-hand side. It's going to find out that there's a variable here. It's going to do a lookup of that, find out that it was defined as this function. And then it's going to inline that back into the expression and then uh, continue from there. And the implementation for function application is also pretty straightforward. Um, like, you know how functions work. You just insert the new uh, the argument into the environment uh, according to the name given in the source code of the function, and then evaluate the body of the function. Pattern matching is another thing that I really like in Elm. Uh, so we're going to implement the basics of pattern matching. So that's the anything pattern, just underscore. Uh, and it's the pattern variable. 
um, and it's a integer constant pattern. It's just the basics we need to continue working. And implementation of the, like interpreting the pattern match is basically going through the pairs of uh, patterns and expressions that we know make sense and do what they are supposed to do. Uh, and if we don't find the match, then we just return nothing instead. Yeah, I have a, um, a bit of a nasty function here, which is the unwrap maybe function. This one will never crash, I promise. But the Elm type system doesn't trust me on this one. <laughs> okay, next up, case expressions. Uh, case expressions are really simple. It's just an expression and a list of pattern expression pairs. And the way we evaluate this is that we go through the pattern expression pair, try to pattern match, <coughs> uh, and as soon as we find a match, we evaluate and return the right-hand side. Next up, we have custom types. I know we're running through a lot of things here, but it's nice. Uh, custom types are mostly living in the type system. So at runtime, we only need a way to uh, tell the different uh, constructors apart. Uh, here I'm using a, the name of the constructor, and then they could have a list of arguments. We don't have to care about the number of arguments or what they are, because that's handled by the type checker. Uh, and similarly for the pattern matches. We don't have to care about the lists lining up in length or anything like that. When we do a function call on a constructor, we just store away the argument and, yeah, just store it away. Um, and when we do a pattern match on a, um, a custom type, we check that the names line up and then we pairwise check the pattern versus the um, the expression and make sure they all line up. Next up, records. They also live mostly in the type system. So at runtime, the representation I'm using here is just a dictionary from field name to expression. <coughs> and um, the pattern matching is just a set of field names. And the implementation of this is pretty much the same as for the custom types. And Finally, we have negation, which is like if you ever want to write minus x in your code. Um, an implementation of this is simplified expression. It should be an integer, otherwise we have a bug somewhere, and then you invert the integer. So just do what it says. So, that was an interpreter for almost all of the Elm programming language in about 10 minutes. So it seems like this is a really simple problem to solve. And now I'm going to try to like, convince you to like, give it a try if you want to, but also tell you that it's not that simple. Because the standard library uses a lot of JavaScript. If you want to be bug compatible with the standard library, you need all of the, the different quirks and edge cases of the, of the JavaScript implementation of back, that's backing Elm you need to re-implement that one. So I've been spending a lot of time implementing JavaScript semantics in Haskell, which is not something I recommend. <laughs> um, so basically, you have to decide if you want to like, make sure everything that's running on the compiler gives the exact same result on the interpreter uh, or not. And about 95% of all the bugs that I've seen so far in the Elm compiler are related to like the fact that integers are actually doubles under the hood. So if you, for example, take integers and multiply them, like really large integers, they will eventually overflow to infinity. And now you have an integer that is infinity, and then you can divide by it, and you get not a number, and so on. And those things are weird. Uh, basically, flows are tricky. Then there's a, a bunch of other few things that uh, you want from an interpreter that you don't um, have in the compiler. Uh, and that's mainly error messages and stack traces and stuff like that. Like stuff you cannot have in the compiler because this is stuff that happens at runtime. And 
since Elm is type safe, these are mostly used for debugging the actual interpreter. And there are th a few things we didn't go through previously uh, when we walked through the different the implementation basically of the, uh, the interpreter. And those are recursion, uh, mutual recursion. We have like multiple functions calling each other in a cycle. And closures, we have a lambda that's referencing a variable from outside of its scope. And also modules, and I guess packages as well, if you want to. These are pretty straightforward to implement. Most of these are implemented on GitHub, and I'll give you a link to the repository uh, after the talk. So, the reason we submitted this talk is because we wrote an interpreter for Elm in Haskell. And we are wondering if we should open source this or not. Initially, we thought that, like, obviously, we should open source this because it's a lot of effort and, um, yeah, we want to give back to the community. But we've been asking around and we haven't found a use case for it yet. So if any of you have any use case for this, please let us know. Uh, but right now, the Elm compiler is really, really good. So like the Elm compiler and then compile into JavaScript and JavaScript runs on these JIT compilers and they have many, many like hundreds of man years spent in optimizing these things and I don't think we'll ever beat them in terms of performance. So yeah, I'm not sure what the extra value we will be giving to, um, to the Elm community with this interpreter. And as I said before, re-implementing all of the kernel code, so native JavaScript code, is a lot of work. Anytime uh, Elm or Elm Explorations releases a new version, we would have to implement that as well, like go through, find all the edge cases that they, maybe they didn't even think about, and uh, make sure we're bug compatible with that as well. So maintaining it is a lot of work, and if no one is using it, it doesn't really make sense to open source it so that we drain resources from the community. And despite all of this, it's still worth it for us to have uh, an interpreter because we are using Elm in this new domain. So we are making small tweaks to the language and basically like diverging it into a sister language uh, to Elm. For example, removing floating points. So yeah, that's it. Uh, if you want to help us build this um, interpreter and the sys language to Elm and all of the tools surrounding that. Uh, we are hiring Haskell, Rust, Scala, and Elm developers in uh, mainly in Aarhus and Marbella, but also in London, Zurich, and uh, remote within Europe. The source for the Elm interpreter in Elm is up on GitHub, and if you want to talk more about it, um, you can find me on Slack or talk to Mario on Slack or talk to me during the rest of the conference. So yeah, thank you.